when I have to pause their systems to meet post-COVID-19 needs to better recover. My name is Francesca Massanello, and I work in the data section of the UN uh, Office on Drugs and Crime based in Vienna. Yesterday, we focused on monitoring gender-based violence, and specifically, we looked at the use of surveys to collect data on gender-based violence, and we also talked about the use of administrative data and other types of data, and that was followed by um, a country case study from Australia on implementing a crime victimization survey and a personal safety survey. Today, we'll be focusing on counting femicides and innovative initiatives to curb violence against women. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor uh, to my colleague, Gabrielle Gammons, who is an interregional advisor and the coordinator of the Development Account Project, who will be talking to us about data governance and collaboration with the data community. Gabrielle, over to you. Thank you very much, Francesca. I don't know if you can hear me. Perfect. Thank you very much. So uh, welcome to this uh, third day of this uh, of this webinar. It's uh, a few minutes past midnight here in New York, and I'm very happy to to be with you and to open this uh, this first uh, this third last day of the of the webinar. i'm I'm going to share my screen now. So very good, excellent. So we, you remember the first day when when I intervened and I, I spoke about about the impact of of COVID nineteen on our capacity to produce important statistics and and indicators. I mentioned that, of course, besides innovation and new data sources, the cooperation and the governance or data governance was something that was fundamental and we learned from the from the COVID-19 crisis that sometimes we have not been really well prepared to uh, to respond or address these emerging data needs related to COVID-19 but eventually also not uh, ready to address any kind of, of data needs in, in, in a situation of crisis. Um, and, and I mentioned that that the governance, uh, data governance and the co-institutional cooperation were fundamental. So I'm going today to, to address this issue and, and quickly go have about 10 minutes to go quickly through this, uh, this, uh, this important topic. In general, I have like two or three days to discuss institutional cooperation and governance. I'm trying to, to do it very, very, very quickly. So why do we need actually uh, uh, a sound governance and, and coordination and particular coordination. We know that the, in the field of gender violence, I mean, there are many actors, there are many producers of, uh, of data and statistics beyond the national statistical system. And it's very important that we're able to partner with them, that we're able actually to collaborate with them in order to get access to the data and produce the statistics and the indicators that are needed. I don't want to speak too long about the advantages of, of coordination, but you have here a definition of coordination that is in general use when we are discussing about coordination within and outside the national statistical system. But the advantages are rather clear. Uh, what we are looking for when we uh, want to improve governance and coordination is efficiency and synergies of operations. We want to avoid overlapping efforts, duplication of work, and reduce the response burden through data sharing. It's very important that all partners producing data and statistics in a specific topic are working together and are sharing the data that sometimes already exists or share the data that they are collecting. Effectiveness is a, a, a key issue. Uh, and what we want is to address the demand for statistics in an organized and timely manner through the capability to jointly produce expected outputs. Uh, we have seen also with COVID-19 that sometimes we're uh, more than one entity within a country producing or addressing the same demand. And of course, these overlapping efforts are not what we are looking for. 
we're looking, and this is fundamental, and you have been discussing about that, the quality, the coherence, the comparability, and the accessibility of official statistics and indicators within across statistical domains, but also beyond the national statistical system to the harmonization of methodology, classification, and dissemination channels. It's very important that all producer of data, statistics and indicators in a specific domain are using the same definitions and methodology, not only within a specific domain, but who are used to work between different domains. So basically economy, environment, social and gender statistics. And these different domains must use as much as possible the same definitions and methodology. And eventually that's the last one is to develop a corporate identity and secure trust in official statistics. We have seen also during COVID-19 that we had a lot of data out uh, on, for example, social media, and all this data didn't have the same quality, but also the same trust. And it's important that we secure trust when we produce our information so that people really uh, um, understand that the information that we are producing uh, is branded as official statistics and can be used for decision making. Of course, I mean, we have different definition of official statistics. The one that I'm using here is the one that in general we have a common agreement about, and it's a rather restrictive one. Official statistics are old statistics that are produced according to the fundamental principles of official statistics by a national statistical office, but not only, of course, by another producer or any other producer of official statistics mandated by the national government or certified by the national statistical office. It is important that we are working according to the fundamental principle of official statistics because they are there to secure the trust in official statistics, I mean, among the users, and also to protect the data providers uh, uh, in particular through the principle of confidentiality. And we know in particular in this domain, how important confidentiality is for the data providers. Uh, I have a few explanatory notes here. I mean, basically what we can say is that within official statistics, what we call also the national statistical system, we have uh, the national statistical office, but also other producers of official statistics that are working according to the fundamental principle of uh, official statistics as adopted by the General Assembly. And here you have uh, uh, another slide with the delineation of the national statistical system. Of course, what we also understood is that in the past, this national statistical system was basically working according to their own sources of information, mainly uh, surveys and censuses that they were uh, conducted. Uh, with the COVID-19, we clearly understood that this was not enough, that the national statistical system jointly with all the data providers should be uh, basically have access to data and use uh, innovative data sources for the production of the different statistics that were needed uh, to measure the impact of the COVID-19 and eventually also to develop recovery policies. Uh, administrative data is, of course, one fundamental non-traditional data sources, but there are many other ones um, that uh, probably have been discussed also during these three days. One is the citizen generated data, generated data web scraping, big data, or geospatial information. All these various sources of statistics, even if they have been collected initially for other purposes than official statistics, should be used definitely for the production of official statistics. Uh, here I have a representation of what we call the national statistical system and the, na the national data ecosystem. You have in blue the national statistical office slightly lighter, the other producer of official statistics. And we have represented here all the other partners 
actually that are uh, um, part of what we call the national data ecosystem. And the objective is to uh, develop sound governance and coordination systems that secure for the National Statistical Office and other producer of official statistics, uh, the access to the data, but also the cooperation, the collaboration and the partnership with these other uh, producer of data that exist in every country and that in the past maybe you have not, we have not uh, contacted or we have not been in contact so much with them. Um, here are a few principles and resolution for coordination that are speaking for in favor of COVID or coordination. We have, of course, the principle eight of the UN fundamental principles of official statistics endorsed by the General Assembly that mentioned that coordination among statistical agencies within countries is essential to achieve consistency and efficiency in the statistical system. But we have also the General Assembly resolution on the SDG indicator framework that mentioned that national statistical office are the coordinators of the national statistical systems and that all activities of the NSS to be conducted in full adherence to the fundamental principles of official statistics. Here, I want to be clear that when we speak about coordination, it does not mean that the National Statistical Office has to be authoritarian in the way of approaching other producer of, of data and statistics in a country. But when we speak about coordination, we speak more about partnership within and outside the national statistical system. And this is a point that is extremely important in that, not only in getting access to the data, but also helping others to improve the quality and the adequacy of the data that are collected, produced within a country for a respective uh, uh, statistical domain. So now very quickly, and I think this is uh, probably my last slide, is what kind of different coordination instruments and mechanisms we can have within a national statistical system, but also beyond the national statistical system. And you remember that we spoke about the national data ecosystem. How can we better work together and coordinate our activities? So we have, of course, and that's a number one, the coordination through normative and legal frameworks. Uh, we have different legislation in a country about statistics, about data protection, about privacy that must be aligned and in favor of uh, partnering between uh, producer of data and statistics within a country with, of course, data providers and taking into account the, the, the request and the requirements from the users. We have the coordination through integrated statistical programs. A lot of emerging domains and, and we are discussing here about something that is emerging, that is a new statistical domain. I mean, gender violence statistics, I mean, needs to be coordinated through an integrated statistical program. We should not have these different statistical domains uh, uh, included in different programs from different partners in, in the national data ecosystem. But as much as possible, all the data collection, processing, and dissemination should be covered by one statistical program. Also because when we have an integrated statistical program, we can secure the funding from the state budget, supporting the production of this information. And, and, and of course, data sources are very important for the production of gender statistics, but we know how much resources are fundamental if we want to produce this information. We have the coordination through data acquisition, collection, and sharing that I've mentioned before, including innovative data sources. We have coordination through methodology, technology, and standards, as mentioned before. Again, if we want our statistics and indicators on gender violence to speak with other statistics that have been produced for environmental purposes, economic purposes, it's very important that the methodology that we are using is aligned with the methodology and the definitions uh, that are used for other statistical domains. 
We have the coordination through dissemination and communication of official statistics. It's better for the users, for example, when they have access to a, a statistic through one national portal, instead of obliging them to go to different uh, uh, websites, for example, to extract uh, the data that are, are, are needed for, for uh, decision making or other purposes. We have the coordination through quality assurance and branding, uh, quality assurance, and in particular, the UN National Quality Assurance for official statistics is also applying uh, to uh, gender violence or gender-based uh, statistics. And it's very important that we use as much as we can this, uh, this uh, quality assurance and branding that exists uh, and have been endorsed internationally. The coordination through human resources, I mean, training and pooling. And there again, the National Statistical Office has an important role to play as the center of excellence for the production and handling of, uh, of data within a country. I mean, it's important that the National Statistical Office not only get access to innovative data sources collected or produced by other actors in the national data ecosystem, but also that the National Statistical Office help them to improve the quality and the accuracy of the data and timeliness disaggregation of the data they are uh, compiling. And then the coordination through international cooperation, cooperation and, and capacity building. I don't want to say more about that since it's, this is exactly the purpose of our webinar. And this is actually the very last um, slide that, uh, that I have on this topic. I mean, we have, uh, and you have seen that, that we have a national statistical system, but we are more and more uh, working uh, or um, reaching out uh, to the national data ecosystem that is broader than just the national statistical system. For the national statistical system, the core of the national data ecosystem, we have a couple of, I would say, uh, regulatory uh, guidelines that exist internationally that have been endorsed. We have the UN Fundamental Principles of Official Statistics already mentioned, the UN National Quality Assurance Framework that I also mentioned. We have in some cases also Regional Statistics Code of Good Practices, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, in Africa, but also applying to other uh, or developed in, in, in other regions like, uh, like in, in Europe. Um, with the European Code of Good Practices. And then we have the national statistical legislation. We have generic law and you have the link here. I think it's interesting to see this link. We have generic law for official statistics for, the, for Latin America and the Caribbean and another set of uh, generic laws for um, your, um, ECE that have been developed for EC European countries. We have international guidelines, methodology and nomenclature that have been endorsed at the international level and as much as possible should be used um, when relevant, of course, should be used at national level. But beyond this set, I would say, of, of uh, guidelines and regulatory framework, we have other ones that are applying to the national data, uh, data ecosystem that are beyond the national statistical system. And we should keep an eye on these ones because they should be aligned with our needs and the needs of our users. If we miss the train there, the problem is that we can be as developed and advanced technologically uh, in using alternative data sources for the production of statistics. But if these regulatory frameworks are not basically mentioning the access to uh, new data, set, data sources for statistical purposes. We, producer of data and statistics, in particular in, for gender, for the gender purposes, we could have actually no access to this data legally. And these one are the Privacy and Data Protection Act that are developed in many countries actually, but we know the European one, the Public Information Access Act, the Archiving Act, the Code of Data Ethics, that exist in many countries and other uh, legal and regulatory framework. So basically this is the end of my presentation, but what I wanted to say here is that we tend to focus, especially experts working in specific statistical domains are more looking uh, from a technological perspective um, 
to other data sources um, for the production of official statistics. But the way we interact with the national data ecosystem, we interact with other data providers and our users is extremely important. And we should not forget that in many cases, this access to data is actually governed by some laws on regulatory frameworks. And it's very important that we participate actively in the development of those ones, not only if they are concerning the national statistical system, but also when they go beyond the national statistical system. Uh, this uh, uh, will secure or could secure or should secure um, a resilient and agile national statistical system so that in the future, if we're facing similar crisis, we will be in a position to provide data and statistics that are needed uh, uh, within our countries. That's it, uh, Francesca, for my presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for this uh, detailed presentation, for the contextual information, and so that we can all understand a little bit better where we're going and, and how we can work together on data. Uh, without any further delay, let me pass the floor to my colleague, Sharita Sarau from UNSCAP. She is a statistician there and she'll be guiding us through the remainder of our day. Uh, Sharita, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So once again, uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, third webinar, the final webinar of this uh, series. And I hope uh, you found the session so far uh, informative and insightful. So as uh, Francesca already mentioned in her opening, uh, today uh, the session will focus on uh, looking at the framework of measuring gender-related killings of women and girls. So in particular, the femicide framework that has been developed by UNODC and uh, UN Women. Uh, we also have a country case study lined up, uh, which is a case study based in India. So we will have uh, somebody speaking from there. And uh, we will also look into, I think this is a session that many of us uh, are awaiting, that is the session on looking at non-traditional data sources to measure violence against women or femicide. So without further ado, let me invite our first speaker for today, uh, Ms. Claudia Pontoglio, Associate Research Officer from the UNODC COSTAT Center of Excellence. And Claudia will be presenting the statistical framework to measure gender-related killings of women and girls, also referred to as femicides. So over to you, Claudia. Hello, how good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, can you see my screen? Just one second. Yes, we do. Uh, you just need to make that full screen, Claudia. Yeah, yes, exactly. yeah that's good. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, in the previous days my, of the webinar series, my colleagues have discussed violence against women and gender-based violence at large. So in this presentation, as uh, was just said, uh, we will look into one specific form of violence against women the gender-related killing of women and girls, uh, also known as femicide or feminicide, as well as femicide data, and uh, specifically a tool jointly developed by UNODC and UN Women to uh, measure it. So one of the most, uh, one out of the different manifestations of violence against women, uh, femicide constitutes the most extreme form. Uh, it is important to notice that there are different approaches to and definitions of femicide, both at the national and international levels. Uh, femicide was defined by the UN Secretary General as the intentional murder of girls uh, and women based on their gender. So combining the definition provided by the International Classification of Crime for Statistical Purposes, or ICCS, and the statistical framework which we will discuss today, uh, femicide or feminicide is the killing of a woman by another person, which includes the intent of the perpetrator to kill or seriously injure the, the victim, and a specific gender-related motivation of the killing, which we will further discuss later today. In 2021, uh, around 45,000 women and girls worldwide uh, have been, were killed by their intimate partners or from another member of their family, which means that on average, more than five women and girls were killed every hour by someone in their own household. So unfortunately, gender-based killings is a worldwide phenomenon. 
And as of 2021, uh, Asia was the region with the largest absolute number of killings of women and girls, uh, with 17,800 homicides out of 14,500 globally, whereas Africa was the region with the highest level of violence relative to the size of the female population of the, of the continent. The hardest thing about femicide is identifying the gender-related motivation behind the act. So the gender-related motivation refers to root causes such as stereotypes of gender roles, discrimination, and unequal power relations. For instance, it might be gender because of factors such as the ideology of men's entitlement and privilege over women, social norms, or the need to enforce gender roles over what is traditionally considered as accept unacceptable female behavior. As follows, estimating the global number of femicide is very challenging. And despite the improvements in the availability and the comparability of homicide data in the past decade, there are still significant data gaps, especially in countries in um, Asia, Oceania, and in uh, Africa. And in some cases, these gaps can be attributed to the lack of reporting mechanisms between uh, regional, national, or international data producers, while in other cases, homicide are simply not recorded by or reported to the competent authorities within the countries. So as of 2021, out of all the UN member states, 173 have reported data on the total number of homicide victims or offenses for at least one year since 2010. Uh, out of these, 133 have reported data with sex disaggregations and only 97 member states have provided information on the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator or other contextual information, which would allow for uh, identification and counting of the gender-related uh, killings of women and girls. This means that uh, out of the estimated 81,100 um, female victims of homicide in 2021, four out of 10 had no contextual information that would allow for them to be identified and therefore to be counted as gender-related killings. To address this issue, the statistical uh, framework was developed. At the 50th uh, United Nations Statistical Commission in March 2019, uh, the commission requested UNODC and UN Women to work and develop a statistical framework on gender-sensitive crime statistics uh, with a specific uh, focus on gender-related killings of women and girls, which was to be aligned with the international classification of crime for statistical purposes. Uh, then it was requested, uh, the request was further uh, reiterated by the Secretary General, and in the same year, UNODC and UN Women started working uh, with, the, started doing the technical work for the framework. So following this internal work uh, between the two agencies, uh, 54 countries were involved in global consultations, which included all relevant stakeholders within the country, such as National Statistics Office, Police, um, Ministry of Interior, Civil Society, Prosecution, Internal uh, Judiciary, International Organization, uh, Human Rights Institutes, and Health Institutes as well. These uh, consultations were held to assess the validity of the characteristics to determine the, the gender-related motivation of crime their relevance for the development of evidence-based evidence prevention policies, and their feasibility in terms of the technical and operational capacities. The aim of the framework, or statistical framework, is to assist the National Statistics Office, institutions in the criminal justice system and in the health, public health system, mechanisms for the advancement of women and gender equality, civil society organization, and academia, in harmonizing data collection within countries, across countries, across regions, and across time. The accept, uh, expected outcomes of the framework um, were, are to strengthen the monitoring of femicide at both the global and the national level, uh, enhance and comprehensive national data, sustainable mechanisms to compare data internationally, and strengthen capacities of member states to collect, uh, analyze, and use quality uh, femicide data. So incorporating the results of the global consultations, the statistical framework was finalized in 2021, and it was uh, submitted to the UN Statistical Commissions, 
and it was finally endorsed at the 53rd session in March 2022. It is currently available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And you can download the framework either from the QR codes that I have uh, put on the, on the screen, on the slide, or from the UNODC website. Uh, if I will pause here for a second if you want to scan the codes. Right. So uh, while the overwhelming majority of homicide victims are male, in the private sphere, uh, more, male, more female homicide victims are recorded. Therefore, whereas women and girls account for only 19% of all homicide victims in the public sphere, uh, it has been recorded that 56% of all the victims killed by an intimate partner or another member of their household are actually female victims. The figure uh, on this slide uh, places the object of the statistical framework, which is femicide, in the broadest context of killings targeting women and girls. Uh, which is divided uh, in this picture according to the relevance of the gender uh, in the killing itself. So the outer layer represents the killing of women and girls overall. The in-between layer represents the intentional homicide of women and girls, and the core level uh, represents the gender-related killing of women and girls. So as repeatedly mentioned in my presentation, uh, the main challenge is measuring the motivation, the gender related motivation, which is behind the killing of women and girls. And it is what it is actually what identifies a homicide as a femicide. Uh, for this, after the technical work done jointly by UNRDC and UN Women and the rounds of global consultations, some data blocks have been added, selected to collect and aggregate statistics on gender-related killings and to identify uh, the gender motivation behind such killings. So uh, in addition to killing of women and girls by intimate partners and by family members, which is based on evidence that these killings are due to gender-related factors, uh, another set of eight characteristics on the right side that you can see on the right side of the screen have been uh, selected as crucial con contextual information for identifying the um, gender-related um, homicides that have happened with a gender-related motive. These characteristics are related to the modus operandi or to the context of the homicide. And they are also considered, as I said, indicative of uh, gender-related motivation for the killings. For instance, as uh, these characteristics, as you can see on the screen, includes the location where the body was disposed, uh, previous criminal records of the perpetrator, the amount of force that has been used, uh, the evidence of sexual violence, and whether the victim, victim was subject to illegal deprivation of liberty, some sort of illegal exploitation, or uh, the victim was working as in the sex industry. So the following uh, disaggregating variables detailed in the that are detailed in the statistical framework are not strictly necessary to identify the gender-related killings, but they are important for conducting comprehensive and a detailed analysis of the killings themselves. Um, so with additional information of this nature to be collected uh, during the, we collected in addition to the homicide information, uh, it is possible to produce uh, policy relevant uh, analysis for identifying the drivers and the enablers of gender-related killings, as well as factors that could help prevent their occurrence. Uh, it's important to notice that also disaggregating variables are an integral part of the ICCS. They're not just related to femicide, but they're to be used for all crimes to collect as much information as possible. Uh, here you can see an example of disaggregating variables. Uh, for instance, you can see an example of gender, uh, the gender identity of the victim, sexual orientation of the victim, or the pregnancy status of the victim with some possible categories. Um, it is very important to note that these aggregating variables are needed not only to identify the femicides as such and to therefore to count them, but they also provide more context to the killings and ultimately they help in developing targeted policies to address uh, this issue. Uh, finally, we'll talk more about it later in the session uh, with my colleagues at the end of this, uh, to, to conclude this webinar. 
but those are the next steps for the framework itself. Uh, UNODC and UN Women have been have started working together uh, to support the member states in implementing the statistical framework. And this started by doing outreach and advocacy. And this, this webinar actually can be considered as a part of this advocacy that we have been doing to raise awareness uh, on this topic and specifically on the framework itself. Uh, the next step for the framework is piloting. So uh, we're considering we would like to pilot these countries in voluntary countries in all continents. And after this piloting session, uh, we will develop technical guidelines and trainings in order to provide targeted technical assistance to the member states. And finally, UNODC and UN Women will report back to the United Nations uh, Statistical Commission in uh, 2025. Um, again, so this piloting would be very useful for um, testing the, the framework and to, we would, uh, UNODC and UN Women combined would help assist the member states in assessing the system and trying to help them like to implement this framework itself. Uh, yeah, that was all. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Claudia, for that uh, very interesting presentation, uh, putting femicide into context uh, within the broader spectrum of uh, gender-based violence. And uh, what's very important to note from what you presented is that femicide is characterized by the gender-related motivation in the killing, including stereotype, gender roles, discrimination, as well as the power relations that you talked about, the unequal power relations. And this is what actually distinguishes or identifies uh, femicide from homicide more broadly. So uh, uh, thank you again, uh, Claudia. And I think we will talk a bit more about the piloting uh, towards the end of the session today. And what I would suggest is um, we move to the next presentation now, which is a case study. And uh, since there are common issues, maybe uh, we'll take questions after the next presentation. So in the meantime, may I invite uh, our participants to think about their questions and put it in the chat box. And uh, also at this point in time uh, in the chat box, my colleagues will be putting uh, a link, uh, which is for a post uh, a webinar survey, which is for basically for evaluation purposes. So this link will be put into the chat box. And uh, whenever you have a moment, uh, could you kindly uh, fill in the survey for us, which will basically give us some feedback on um, how you felt about uh, these three webinars that we ran uh, since the 25th of April. We would just like to get your feedback to, to make improvements for future sessions. Uh, so thank you in advance for your cooperation to fill that survey in. So without uh, further delay, let me now invite our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Harish Patak. Uh, Dr. Patak is Dean and Head of the Department uh, of Forensics, Medicines and Toxicology at the State GS Medical College and King Edward Memorial Hospital uh, based in Mumbai, India. And Dr. Patak will be presenting to us a very interesting uh, and rather unique study. It is an autopsy-based cross-sectional study from Mumbai which, which basically provides insights on deaths due to gender-based violence. So over to you, Dr. Patak. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, not as yet. Uh, Dr. Patak, if you have issues at your end, do you think uh, we should put it up from our side? Oh, no. Oh, one second. I think. Sure. All right. I think it's coming up. Oh. 
people, right? Yes. Um, no? yes, we see it now. Thank you. So, thank you very much. So, uh, we did with this study, which is autopsy based, and uh, what we did was uh, uh, with the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, we conducted this study. Uh, it was retrospective study, and uh, the aim was to understand the proportion and pattern of death due to gender-based violence among females of all ages and non-binary gender. So to begin with, uh, we needed, uh, we had to uh, arrive at uh, the definition, what should be the working definition. So death due to gender-based violence are intentional homicide and abated suicide of women, girls, and non-binary gender perpetrated by intimate partners, other family members, or other identified or unidentified individuals using methods or circumstances that suggest gender-based motivations. So uh, earlier presentation, I saw that uh, it was only homicide which were taken into consideration. But what we have realized is that you uh, need not, uh, they, uh, the perpetrators need not kill a uh, woman. They create a circumstances where is she's, uh, she's uh, uh, forced to kill herself. Even that uh, should be considered as femicide. So this was the working definition that we considered so the study design was, it was retrospective and cross-sectional sampling record of autopsies of female and non-binary unnatural death conducted between 2000, May 2017 to April 2022. What were the inclusion criteria, unnatural deaths, accidental exposure to unspecified factors or intoxication or injuries and death claimed to be suicides, accident in which the nature of injury does not harmonize with history or autopsy findings. So data extraction was done, data from women, girls, and non-binary genders that died from unnatural causes were extracted from all autopsy records. Most of the information was descriptive in the local language, that is Marathi, it was translated into English. Information related to violence was mined from the detailed history in the records, whatever records available with us. The perpetrator details were validated from police record whenever, wherever available, data was structured and digitized and data were analyzed and interpreted. So total number of autopsies uh, in those five years was 6,190. Death of females, including non-binary, 1,467. Death due to unnatural cause, 840. And underlying history of violence in 181 cases. So around 12.3% of autopsies on females had history of gender bed violence. Uh, Three-fourths of the victim were aged between 15 to 44 years. This is the statistics that uh, we have given. Uh, now, manner of death, 85 percent, uh, oh, sorry, 47 percent, that is 85 were accidental suicides, 47 percent, and homicide, 10 percent. Nature of injuries, 58 percent were burn injuries. And it's very famous that and in Indian context, we should uh, know that uh, it's uh, rather very infamous of dowry deaths and burnt women. So 58% were burns, 20% hanging, 16% poisoning, 3% assault, and 3% jump from height. Most incident took place in homes or private places. So only one person was on road. Otherwise, all suicides, homicides, accidental deaths, so-called accidental deaths were at home or private spaces. Two third of the victims were married and six of the 10 crimes were perpetrated by husband or intimate partners. Six out of Six out of 10 instances, the underlying reason was marital discord or dispute. What were the challenges? Data extraction from handwritten paper format in local language. We are trying to do uh, to digitize it. Incomplete data related to victims and perpetrators, sociodemographic status in hospital records, lack of contextual data in of the acts of violence of 
victims of death biases in recognizing underlying gender based violence in suicidal and accidental deaths non reporting of violence due to socio cultural factor at the time of inquiry poses a barrier to the investigation and in depth documentation of the case like in almost 40% of the suicidal cases parents uh, the family said we don't know why she committed suicide and uh, it cannot happen uh, it's very high percentage and many times a few, if it was due to a uh, failure of an affair uh, the uh, parents don't want to come out and speak about it whereas in cases of male almost all cases we know uh, th there was history of why that person committed suicide what was the reason what were the circumstances leading to those situation but in 40% of the female suicidal deaths there was no history given no reason was given on record limited access to police re record for data validation was another limitation uh, for this study now uh, what are the conclusion there is gender related killing is brutal manifestation of consume of violence women and girls are most likely to be killed by those closest to them more investigation into injuries due to burn can shed light on social factors related to violence now uh, the victim has given history of accidental fire while cooking but the time of incidence is 1 am 1:30 am that's not the time when she is going to cook we know that what she is speaking may not be the truth and but Uh, somehow police are not in uh, police don't investigate further investigate and there is uh, lack of even motivation from family members to further pursue the case so the case which we can say scientifically forensically appears to be a case of suicide is on record is goes as a accidental uh, death so we need to uh, shed more light and more investigation are required in such cases comprehensive data on gender related violence can inform protection and response measures so <coughs> we are planning to have a training program for medical officers and police officers on how uh, we can uh, the gap in the data collection can be filled by uh, collecting additional information sensitizing them and uh, this was a study only at one medical college one autopsy center so we are planning to do for the whole city and that will be a prospective study after the uh, training and sensitization of uh, police officers and uh, uh, medical officer who conduct autopsy recommendations standardize data collection tool digitize data of all violence or unnatural deaths conduct qualitative inquiry into factors associated with an unnatural deaths during history taking or autopsy at systemic level build capacities of relevant personnel health and police and first line response to identify elicit and record sensitive information related to uh, gender based violence develop mechanism to allow regular engagement with sector specific personnel and establish a technical review committee to a committee comp uh, comprising relevant experts to review data on unnatural deaths thank you thank you very much uh, dr patak for sharing this uh, case study with us demonstrating how autopsy records uh, were used to identify cases of gender based violence um, Uh, we see the importance of contextual data in your presentation so without contextual data it's difficult to recognize and identify underlying cases of gender based violence and especially uh, since you spoke about cases of suicide and accidental deaths so that contextual information becomes extremely important to be able to accurately identify if it was a case of violence um also your last message there uh, that uh, there is need to strengthen administrative data collection and improve cause of death reporting uh is very important in order to generate reliable estimates for gender based violence so with that uh, let me now open the floor for uh questions and uh i actually see one hand raised at this point uh oh, there are two hands and we also have a question in the chat box so let me start with uh nareesh shrestha 
would you would you like to take the floor? Uh, Naresh, uh, do you have a question? Would you like to take the floor or maybe type your question in the chat box? All right. Uh, yes, yes, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very uh, informative presentation. Uh, also in Pakistan, there is common women killing in the name of honor. No any implementation of laws here. Man practice feudalism. Uh, yeah, so women death is in high risk nowadays. Daily two or three women killing in sin. Police also ignore such cases due to name of honors. All right, thank you for that uh, intervention and uh, that information. I think this, the, these are issues that are common uh, in the South Asian country. So what you're referring to is uh, is what Dr. Patak was talking about, the, the honor killings and the dowry deaths, which are quite common to the cultural context uh, in South Asia. Uh, uh, Naresh, would you still like to take the floor? I still see your hand up. Oh, sorry. It just happened. No okay. question, please. All right, thank you. Uh, Ambar, Ambar Nas. All right, and I, I think uh, let's go to the chat box. So there's a question in the chat box which says, how does one classify a suicide case as one of femicide? Is there forensic ground to support this? Can this be considered as a ground for the filing of a criminal case for domestic violence? So Dr. Harish, is this something you can address? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I will give you a few examples. No worry, no worry, no. Hello. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Hello. Uh, yes, please, Dr. Patak, please go ahead. Yeah. So uh, there are cases wherein uh, the history is that there was accidental fire at home while cooking. Uh, and uh, when a patient is brought to us, it's 90% burns and from head to toe. And this cannot happen without the use of fire accelerants like kerosene or something. Uh, but she gives this history because while she's being brought to hospital, her in-laws will say that, okay, if you tell that uh, you committed suicide because of the torture from her, your husband, your husband will be behind the bar. What will happen to your kids who will look after them? So she's emotionally, you know, uh, blackmailed or whatever, of course, and she gives false history. And we have seen this multiple times. So forensically, we can see very clearly that what she speaks does not make the uh, makes any technical sense, scientific sense. Another, like while cooking, the what was the time of uh, incidence? One a.m., one thirty a.m. Nobody cooks at that time. That's not the time of cooking. So, as well as the pattern of burns. So when you see that, you can easily make out that uh, it's not accidental. It is definitely suicidal. But she's giving the history of accidental. And if we further, in, uh, if parents do give a uh, complaint and we do further investigation, the uh, victims have changed their statements later on. So uh, definitely uh, you have to apply your forensic mind and, and common sense uh, wherein you can find uh, there is no matching of you know uh, matching of the history and what you have found and further investigation can definitely reveal uh, the crime of abatement of suicide and there could be multiple reasons for that thank you uh, dr patak uh, uh, so colleagues let me clarify that we are actually now taking questions uh, on both presentations, on the presentation from Dr. Patak and also the presentation made by Claudia earlier. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box. I'll just move to the next question from Jessica Gardner. Um, she's uh, asking Dr. Patak, could you please say more about how the underlying reasons, example, marital discord for women's death were determined in your study? 
there is uh, there are clear cut uh, complaint from the uh, from parents or uh, family members of the girl that there was demand of dowry okay that uh, which we could not fulfill and that was one thing she was being tortured for various reasons maybe for giving birth to a girl child they wanted male child number uh, so the, whenever there is clear cut history of uh, history or complaint from the uh, from uh, parents uh, then uh, the police arrives at this conclusion and then uh, accordingly uh, we have also uh, actually we have extracted data from the police records so we took it as a uh, you know marital discord Thank you. The next question that I see here is perhaps for Claudia. Uh, this question uh, says that, have any gender-based variables been identified for the 81% of male being victim of homicide? To what extent it's accurate to attribute the 19% of female victim of homicide as cases of femicide? Uh, Claudia, is this something you can address? Yes, I think my colleague David can take over this question, if you're there. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, good morning. So um, regarding the uh, question on the 81% um, of male victims, so yeah, first of all, let me just remind. So we are producing these estimates um, here in UNODC in Vienna based on uh, data reported by countries or data that uh, we find on uh, country websites. Um, so globally, we estimate that uh, about four in five homicide victims are males. Of these uh, homicide victims, um, actually most of uh, male victims of homicides are killed outside of the house. So about 90% uh, are killed by perpetrators that are not family members or intimate partners. And only 10% are killed by, uh, by family members and intimate partners. Now, when we look at homicide victims um, female homicide victims, um, about, uh, I think it's 56% of uh, female victims of homicides are killed by the intimate partner or family members. So we are using that as a proxy uh, for femicides. But if you recall the slide presented by Claudia, um, femicides goes beyond uh, killings by intimate partner and, uh, and family members uh, where there are uh, a few other reasons. Uh, the victim was, for example, uh, there was a rape before before um, the killing, or if uh, the victim was uh, targeted because of um, membership in a specific uh, organization uh, and, and other reasons. Unfortunately, we do not have data at the global level to measure that. So all we can do at the global level is, and regional level, is measure the or produce an estimate of uh, female victims by intimate partner and family members, which again is much higher that share for women than for men. Thank you. All right, thanks, uh, David. I do not see any further questions at this point uh, in the chat box. So may I suggest, uh, so thank you again to both our speakers, uh, Claudia and Dr. Patek, and we will move to the next presentation. And as we go along, perhaps uh, there might be more questions that come up after that presentation. So let me int introduce our next speaker. And now we are actually going to switch the topic a bit in the sense that we'll move into looking at non-traditional data sources. So all this while we have discussed uh, data through administrative sources as well as surveys. And uh, through the next presentation, uh, we, will, we will look into how emergency telephone data could be used uh, as a source of data for violence against women. So let me invite uh, Ms. Salome Flores Sierra, head of the UN ODC Information Center at the Regional Office uh, for Central Asia. And she will talk about violence against, how violence against women can be prevented uh, or addressed using non-traditional data sources. So over to you, Salome. Thank you, Sharita. Good morning, good evening, colleagues. Uh, thanks for the invitation to present to you uh, this experience of looking at other uh, possible data sources that can inform us about um, gender-based violence. Um, I think you can see my presentation now, right? Can you please confirm? Good. 
Yeah. So this is really um, to explore other data sources. I think for the last two days, we have had conversations about um, surveys, household surveys, dedicated surveys to explore violence against women. We have also discussed administrative records, but we have also seen a lot of questions in the chat about how to prevent uh, gender-based violence. And of course, we all are interested in having better data, better statistics, disaggregated data, but um, the, the sources that we have been discussed faced a common issue, which is uh, timeliness. So if we see the data from surveys or if we see administrative records, we would see a picture in the past. We are not able to see um, what is really happening today or what happened um, yesterday. So we did an experiment really uh, to try to uh, review other data sources. And this is what I want to share with you today. Um, so just to start, I was talking about um, the different data sources. And in this uh, table here, I just included some of the advantages and disadvantages of these two data sources that we have been discussed for the last two days. Um, I'm not going to, into the detail, but uh, yeah, as you can see, both data sources offer some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, there's still a lot of work to do uh, to improve administrative records. Usually institutions face different sort, uh, types of challenges. Uh, usually we see that uh, statistical areas lack capacities, lack technologies, they even lack staff. And of course they lack uh, proper training or proper technology so, uh, or proper um, standards even. So uh, there, again, uh, the idea of these webinars is to try to work with uh, institutions and try to uh, help them to improve the records that they have. And this is very good. Then on the other side, we have household surveys that are very specific to measure very specific aspects and household surveys, uh, if they're dedicated to, to measure violence against women, can give us a lot of information about the victim, about the context of different type of types of violences and they're very useful, but again, they provide us an overview of what had happened in the past. And um, in this presentation, what I want to share with you is a little bit of an experiment that we did uh, looking into information from emergency lines. Um, so just to give you context about this experiment, in this slide, you can see uh, information on violence against women from administrative records. This is from for last year, for 2022, and this is for the whole of Mexico. So as you can see, according to administrative records, uh, the authorities have recorded uh, a number, an important number, I'm not just gonna say, for example, you can see 2022, or uh, 77,466, uh, 77, incidents related to violence against women. And as you can see, the trend has improved, I mean, has increased from 2020 until 2022, it's, it's going up. If we see the breakdown, but by different type of uh, behavior, you will see that the authorities usually report uh, these categories that you see on the right-hand side, and they have all been increasing or almost all of them. So you see sexual abuse, sexual harassment, uh, sexual harassment within the workplace, uh, you see rapes and other types of violences, including uh, femicide. And if we see at these numbers, we think that the, the violence against women has a huge incidence in, in Mexico. Again, this is only based on administrative records. But then if we see uh, or we try to see what is going on using a different data source, um, the picture will be very different. So this is information again for Mexico. 
uh, for uh, but coming from uh, a dedicated survey. This is the national survey on the dynamics of household relationships. And this is a survey that is conducted every four years by the National Statistical Office of Mexico. So you see that for 2021, um, half, almost half of the population in Mexico was a woman. And out of those, 77% were 15 years or more. That is about 50 million people. So based on the um, survey, we can see that out of those, 70% had experienced at least one incidence of violence throughout their lives. And then if we looked at the one year period, out of those, we would see that 42.8% were victim of uh, some sort of violence in a period of 12 months. This is between October 2020 to October 2021. So if we think about this percentage as a number, we can imagine that if we're talking about millions of, of women that were victims of one incidence of violence against women. So again, if we go back and, and see the previous figure of the actual crimes that were recorded based on administrative records, we see that they are thousands. But then if we go back to the survey, we are thinking about millions. And this is um, something that we call the dark figure of crime. This is, these are all the crimes that are not reported to the authorities. Um, so as we know, uh, men, in many countries, authorities make efforts for um, helping or assisting the population to uh, report their incidents to the authorities or other types of um, institutions or um, um, organizations that can support victims. But as we can see from the figures, uh, there are so many incidents or, or yeah, behaviors that are not reported and are not recorded and basically that are invisible for the authorities. So we're, there's not much that they can do about them. So we were trying to see other alternative data sources uh, to understand if through other uh, information, we could not only measure violence against women in a more comprehensive way, but also if we could use other alternative data sources to actually prevent violence against women. So because of this, uh, we were looking, or we had the opportunity to look at the records from emergency lines. In many countries, these are called 911 um, lines. And uh, the idea of uh, reviewing this information from emergency lines was that uh, usually uh, there are records every day. Uh, these records allow us to have information or geographic information about the actual location, the type of location in which violence or violent incidents are happening. Uh, through emergency lines, we can also understand uh, more about the type of violence and the context in which is happening. But also through emergency lines, authorities are able to channel um, the actual behavior to different types of authorities. Uh, it could be police, it, would, it could be health, services or other types of services. So what we did um, was to review uh, some of, of these uh, reports, daily reports from emergency lines for a state uh, in Mexico for one year, for the period, for a one year period. And just to give you a flavor of the individual records that we were able to see, I'm gonna show you, this is the, the transcription of what we found. So you can imagine there is a, a, an operator uh, receiving a call from someone, and this is basically what the operator is typing on a computer. So the operator will type, a user reports that there is a female person that is on the floor uh, and that is yelling uh, for help and uh, she was fighting with her partner. Apparently it was a foot fracture. She indicates that her partner ran over her. And yeah, this is kind of just some of the words that we found on one single record. And I, what I want to tell you is how was this report classified? 
And so the classification that the operator used um, to record this incident was it was under accidents and the specific incident was recorded as a run over. This is another case, uh, a user, uh, a female was fighting with her partner. She comments that he tried to suffocate her and she almost can breathe. So we can see that uh, well, it was a female part partner and um, it was basically trying to strangulate the women. And this is how this incident was recorded. So it was recorded on the classification of clinicals and specifically as a respiratory difficulty, respiratory urgency. So no indication about violence against women in these two cases. Uh, we're gonna see uh, a very disturbing behavior actually in the next example. So, and this is very extreme really. So this, this incident refers to her husband caught her thumb. There is more description there. She said that her partner was very aggressive. We're just highlight, highlighting the key words that were recorded on this incident. And the way this incident was shown was under the category of uh, traumatic incidents, specifically as an amputation. So again, no indication about violence against women here. And, and this is really, uh, well, when we saw these records, we thought that these data source would, I mean, had potential to not only to improve the number of incidents, but more importantly, to give us action, actionable information so authorities can act and actually prioritize the attention to those cases that seem extreme like this one. Uh, and this is the whole idea of us looking into this information from emergency lines. So back in Mexico, there is a national catalog uh, to classify emergency incidents. Um, the catalog aims to standardize definitions, to identify, classify, and register incidents, and of course, improve statistical, statistical analysis of different incidents. At the national level, usually uh, emergency lines get about 15 million calls. And just to share with you, again, we access information from one single state from one year, and uh, the numbers that they recorded were about 1 million. So what we did uh, was we took this 1 million uh, and we use artificial intelligence. We developed a model to um, extract all those words that could be related to violence against women. And this is uh, what we found when comparing different data sources. So if you see, I mean, when comparing what administrative records um, recorded as violence against women and what the actual um, models, uh, uh, well, yeah, artificial intelligence, machine learning models capture. So as you can see uh, below, the events recorded as violence against women by the authorities, this is administrative records for this state, were a bit more than 7,000. And this is the line that we see here below um, by month. But then using artificial intelligence, we were able to extract these words and you can see um, the number increased significantly. And then uh, after training the model uh, and yeah, making sure that all our um, words or the words that were classified as violence against women were refined, we were able to identify a lot more than the actual information that administrative records were able to capture. So basically, this is just an example of how we can use technology, not only to measure uh, um, violence against women in a better way and in a more accurate way, but again, to get to be able to extract information that authorities can use uh, to prevent violence from escalating, as you can, as you saw from the examples that I that I shared. If authorities um, have information on, on those incidents and record those incidents properly, they could be a follow up to, of these cases, and violence can be prevented from escalating. Um, so, just to give you. Um, more information about the technology that we've used. 
we use artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and the, the, we use them by developing a model uh, to analyze, again, the, the words, extracting uh, those um, key elements that uh, could help us to identify violence against women. And, and there we used a model of predictive analytics uh, that it's a neural network. And uh, well, the, the technical description is there. It's a novel architecture that aims to solve sequence to sequence tasks while handling long range dependencies on texts easily. So or on texts or words, which is what we really uh, did in this uh, um, example. So how can we use emergency lines records to monitor and prevent violence, to prevent violence against women? Basically, uh, we believe that through this project, we can actually work with countries that can be interested in uh, working with us to improve their emergency call records to identify cases of violence against women, try to use artific artificial intelligence to detect those cases that are riskier, and uh, using these technologies to prioritize to prioritize attention of those cases in which uh, violence against women may escalate. And uh, I think with this, I'll stop here and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Sharita. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Salome, sorry, uh, that was very interesting, uh, highlighting how non-traditional data sources can actually complement uh, admin data to fill in some of uh, the data gaps. And as you pointed out, emergency phone data in particular can provide high frequency data. So we can potentially get additional information on location, type of violence, as well as context to some extent. And uh, it it's also provides us that real time information, which can be useful for the police, for health and other types of services. So thank you for pointing that, um, pointing that out. So let me open the floor very quickly for uh, any questions we have at this time. So I see uh, a question in the chat box uh, for you, Salomu. Um, I'm not sure if you can access the question. Uh, don't you think that don't you think registering of violence against women has increased due to awareness in society and the governments? government's resolve to implement international treaties. Increase in administrative data regarding gender-based violence cannot necessarily be an indicator of increasing trends in gender-based violence. If the statistics of states is reflected on inter at the international level, branding the nation's bad people, the governments will start fudging the figures of refusing to register the cases. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on this? Thank you, Sharita. Yes, I can. I can see the question. Um, I think that uh, one uh, element that we have to remember is that uh, statistics is not only one indicator, but, but but rather a combination of different indicators. And I think that we need to uh, work together with with countries, with government authorities, with civil society. Uh, to understand what data is telling us from different data sources to avoid having misleading um, information. And I know, uh, well, UNODC works a lot with governments to improve the information that they have to advise uh, on how to adopt methodologies that can provide or, or can generate uh, sound statistics. So, and we also um, try to uh, make sure that by following international standards and sound methodologies, the information that generate, they generate or may generate is accurate and, and transparent as well. Uh, this is not easy, but what I'm saying here is that as UNODC and to also together with other agencies, we try to advise uh, countries on how to produce data in a way that is transparent and that is not um, misleading for, for, for everyone, the society as a whole and the, and the, and the world in general. But also, um, I think it's, it's also important to um, bring other communities to not only uh, check out the statistics, but actually review how these statistics are collected and validated and disseminated. So we are all uh, sure about what, what data is telling us. And again, 
we have to make an effort or not only understanding the statistics, but also looking at different data sources to have a better picture of violence against women. And I agree. I think uh, we have, after the pandemic, we have more um, awareness of, of reporting. And in a way, that's good because at the end of the day, statistics help us to make uh, visible what it's invisible. And only if it's visible, we can address it and try to prevent it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think there's just one more question there. Uh, are your AI and machine learning tools open source? Can others adapt these in, in other countries? Yes, uh, we used open data source, I mean, the open source uh, tools. And the whole idea of these webinars is also to try to identify volunteer countries uh, so we can apply and transfer uh, these technologies so they can use it for, for this purpose of uh, monitoring and identifying violence against women and prevent it. So if there is an, an interest, we will be happy to work uh, with, with you or with anyone uh, that is willing to, to um, have us uh, transferring this uh, exercise and, uh, and implementing it uh, for using it. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, in the interest of time, may I suggest that we just move to the next activity and for the remaining comments and questions uh, in the chat box, uh, we'll try to address them in the chat box. So uh, relevant colleagues will respond to these in the chat box itself. So uh, the, the next thing that we have is that we've just lined up a small activity for you that is a, a quiz that we will put up uh, on the screen. And uh, this is just to make the session a bit more interactive and uh, to to basically clarify our understanding on some of the key concepts and issues that we have discussed over the last three days. So we invite you to actively participate in this quiz. It's very short, just 10 questions, and uh, hopefully we can go through this uh, very fast. So may I invite my colleagues to kindly put up this uh, quiz on the screen, please. So uh, we have the first question here. And this is basically a, a, a poll in Zoom itself. So I believe uh, you can see this on your screen and you should be able to tick this off directly on the screen, your responses. So the first question uh, is uh, we're, we're looking at All right, uh, just, just a moment, please. With regard to the technology, I'm just checking. Uh, is it possible to have one question at a time on the screen? Not really. All right, so Salome, are they able to respond directly on the screen itself, question by question? Is that how it, this works? Yes, they should be able to uh, answer. And we, we get a summary of responses on the screen as well? At the end, yes. At the end of all questions, you mean? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So let's uh, go question by question, uh, colleagues. Uh, I'm not sure if I should read out uh, or should we just give everyone two minutes to respond? I think it's good if you read it. All right. So let's go with the first question, uh, which is basically testing our knowledge on the sustainable development goals. and. Uh, we're, we're basically asking which sustainable development goals have specific targets related to gender-based violence. So you have four options there and uh, kindly tick off uh, what you think is the best choice. So you have uh, like 15 seconds to answer that before we move to the next question. So let me now move to the second question, which basically asks uh, gender-based violence, uh, which of the following statements actually uh, applies to gender-based violence? So uh, make a single choice. You just need to tick off the, the st statement that you think is the most appropriate one here.
All right, we move to question number three. The most widespread form of violence against women globally is which of these choices? Uh, please uh, select a single choice. Question four, prevalence in the context of violence means which of these? Again, uh, you're expected to tick off the best option here. All right, in question five, uh, we're asking uh, estimates of prevalence of violence against women taking place within a population can be obtained from. So we have four different data sources here. And uh, what do you think would be the data source for estimates of uh, prevalence of violence against women? Question six is also related to prevalence, uh, which basically asks the time periods used for computation of prevalence of violence are which of the following. So here it's a multiple choice option. You can choose more than one of the responses. Okay, we move to question seven, which is usually the most comprehensive source of data on intimate partner violence against women? Again, please choose a single choice here. Question eight, femicide includes or is characterized by which one of the following statements is correct? Please tick one statement. Question nine, administrative data for gender-based violence is which of the following statements is correct? Please tick one statement. And the final question, for which of these is population-based survey data not the most suitable? Please tick one of the statements that have, that have been put up there. So if everyone has uh, finished uh, voting, uh, is it possible to get the results uh, on the screen now?
All right, so for the first question, I see that uh, most of our respondents have got the, the response right. It is in fact SDG 5 and SDG 16 are the ones that have uh, some very specific targets related to violence. For the other SDGs that have been listed there, they are somehow connected with violence in the sense that violence could be an impediment to the achievement of these uh, SDGs. For, for the SDG in poverty, for instance, uh, violence can cost uh, economies millions of dollars per year. Uh, and similarly, SDG 3 and 4, uh, violence uh, against women can basically affect their health and well-being, their uh, access to education, and so on and so forth. Question number two, gender-based violence, uh, which of the following statements is correct? Um, again, I see that the majority have got this correct. It is all of the above. So gender-based violence is can include violence against women and girls, men and boys, but it is women and girls who are more likely to be affected than men and boys. Uh, for question number three, uh, the most widespread form of violence against women globally. Uh, again, I see that most of our respondents have got this one right. It is, in fact, intimate partner violence, and uh, intimate partner violence uh, can take various forms. Of course, uh, it does include um, physical violence. It includes sexual violence, as well as um, psychological violence. Uh, it could include femicide as well, for instance. The next question, uh, prevalence in the context of violence means which of the following? Um, here again, I see that this looks like uh, people were a little bit confused here. So the correct answer uh, in this case is actually option number two. And I see that most people did not get this right. So prevalence uh, in the case, in the context of violence basically is about counting people rather than counting events or incidents. It is not about, uh, so option A and C really is about counting incidents. So the correct option is about counting people because we're looking at the proportion of women that are affected out of the total population of women at risk here. Question number five, estimates of the prevalence of violence against women taking place within the population can be obtained from which of the following? Yes, 58% uh, say it is survey data and that is in fact correct because prevalence is, as I mentioned, uh, is the proportion of women who have experienced violence as part of the population, at, the population of women at risk and surveys are not only the most comprehensive but in fact the only data source that can measure prevalence. Question number six, the time periods um, used for computation of prevalence of violence against women. Here, um, it is the correct answer is lifetime and the last 12 months. The last one month is actually incorrect. It's too short a time period because uh, generally we ask over a lifetime, did it ever happen? Or we ask the current situation. And when we say current, we, we find out whether violence has been experienced in the last 12 months. Question seven, which is usually the most comprehensive source of data on intimate partner violence against women? And the correct answer here is actually dedicated uh, surveys because dedicated surveys uh, give us the most comprehensive information as they, although they cost more, these uh, surveys are the ones through which you can get uh, a broader set of variables. They are more flexible and also the sample design itself can be tailored. If you compare it to a module, where you would have to uh, comply with the, with the requirements of the host survey in a dedicated survey, you can tailor the survey to the requirements uh, that you have in terms of what uh, variables you want to actually collect. Question eight, femicide includes or is characterized by which of the following? So this is something we just discussed this morning. And the correct answer here is uh, gender-related motivation of the killing. And uh, we, we see that 62% of our respondents have got that right. Uh, the next question, administrative data for gender-based violence, which of these statements is correct? And here again, um, I see that most of you have got this right. It can have incoherent use of standards and concepts. So that is uh, the correct statement there, because as we know, when it comes to administrative data, there is always difficulty reconciling data across different sources. And for the final question, for which of these is population-based survey data not the most suitable? 
And the correct answer here actually is option number two, that is to know if there is an increase or decrease in women accessing support services. Because uh, the other three, other two statements uh, that we have there, uh, they, they basically refer more to survey data, but statement B is, uh, you know, access, increase or decrease in access to support services is the type of data that you would get from administrative sources. This is data collected at source. So well, thank you very much for your participation. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little quiz and it just gave you uh, a little more clarity on some of the important concepts that we've discussed over the last three days. So with that, I'm going to hand the floor back uh, over to my colleague, Francesca, who's going to do a final closing and uh, tell us about the next steps. So over to you, Francesca. Thank you so much for that, Sharita. So I realize that we've gone over by a few minutes. So if I can just ask for your patience for another two minutes, we should be concluding. I'd just like to remind all the participants that we have posted in the chat box, the post webinar survey, which we'll be using for evaluation purposes. And I'll just take a moment to share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about the next steps in this development account project. So as mentioned on the first day by our colleague Gabrielle, we'll be identifying 15 target countries. Uh, and this will be a process that will include all of the entities that are involved in this project. So those dealing on data governance, dealing on environmental issues and so on and so forth. Um, and then basically how that assistance will be delivered will be uh, decided based on a roadmap that's going to be established with each target country. And so the way this process will work is that we're looking for interests of expression specifically from national institutions. So this can be national statistical offices, ministries and so on and so forth. And we kindly ask for this expression of interest to be communicated to us by uh, the 31st of July so that we can begin working with, with the other entities to identify the overall target countries. So you may be wondering, what are the topics that will be covered um, in for these target countries? So there'll actually be two of the topics that we touched upon today, which will be the piloting of the, stati of the statistical framework on, on femicides. And here, I just like to mention that the development of the statistical framework was a tremendous undertaking and it was you know a, a multi-entity effort you know not only UNODC but also UN Women as well as the center of excellence based in Mexico so we wouldn't have been able to do it without all three of these these partners and then the second topic that we are looking to to impl implement and replicate is actually the example used by my colleague Salome on the use of innovative techniques. So how can we make use of emergency data to measure violence against women? And here at the bottom of the screen, you have the contact details for ourselves here, um, our team in UNODC, as well as my, con my colleague Sharita from SCAP. So please note down these email addresses. And not only for the expression of interest, but if you do have other questions related to this three day webinar session, please don't hesitate to to reach out to us. We we know that sometimes questions come up after the end of a webinar. I'd also like to mention that we will be sharing certificates via email with all of the registered participants. So that will be coming to you directly in the coming days. And last but not least, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of my colleagues, my fellow panelists, to all of you, the participants for dedicating so much time to be here with us over the last three days. And we wish you a pleasant rest of the week and all the best. Thanks very much.